since the last class, we've been talking about the uh, experiment data and the measurement on the velocity and the attenuation of the particulate material, so using rocks with the different condition. Right? And we've seen the effect of water saturation and what else? We see the uh, effect of isotropy loading. Right? Um, today we'll see the effect of anisotropy of the soil. So when you have different stress condition or if you have some fabric, so you, you don't have any more the round particle. So you may have like very platy particle, right? And after that, the cementation effect will be covered and the creep effect will be covered. Okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, stress on isotropy. And here, um, when you have a P wave, particle motion is parallel to the direction of the wave propagation. So you have compression of wave, then the particle moves parallel to the uh, wave direction, right? Propagation direction. But when you think about the oh, so so that here the uh, P wave velocity is affected by the stress at the particle movement direction. Okay. 하나 더 꺼도 될것 같아. 여기도. 어. Good. But the, when we think about the secondary wave, the shear wave, particle moves perpendicular to the uh, direction of the wave of propagation, right? So then, wave goes to this direction, but the particle moves this direction. So if there's a difference in stress in both direction, then each plane or the each stress will act differently to the wave propagation. So here you can think of two stress is affecting to the velocity of the shear wave, and V A the sigma x is the stress applying parallel to the what propagation direction, and the sigma y is the what the one acting on the particle movement direction. So, and you have a different value for uh, its power exponent, theta and the delta, right? And you can express this <coughs> you can express this, uh, this expression with the mean effective stress. So this is the uh, what average of the sigma x and sigma y. So mean stress. And the the second term is the deviatoric stress, right? Or the shear stress, the deviatoric. Right. So here you can think of like right, uh, confining stress, and this will be the like, axial deviatoric stress. And then, because the, it has different term, you have different power exponent. This, uh, I say, how do you call this? Mu? And psi, maybe. So, if you have isotropic confinement or the isotropic stress condition, sigma not prime, so you don't have the uh, difference in uh, stresses, then these two equations becomes the uh, just become reduce the uh, same equation, right? Yeah, the one with the. Uh, So then, uh, this is the data of the RCTS, resonant column test, of, I think it's the uh, Ottawa sand. And uh, let's look at the loading curve first. Here you had the IR means the isotropy loading. So firstly, you apply the sigma 3, right? Isotropy loading to around 200 kilopascal. And then you apply the axial compression. So now you are applying the deviatoric stress on the top only. Right? And the confining stress, the lateral stress are the same. And at the point that you have a vertical strain like this. And then you unloaded the axial compression. And then you 
release the old confining stress. Right? So you can see that you have compression to this point, and then when you unload it, the every load, every stress becomes the vertical strain. It remain with the, uh, this uh, vertical strain by about 1.2 percent. So you have like plastic strain about this 1.2 percent, and this is the uh, velocity, shear wave velocity during isotropy loading. So this is the case with the IL and the IU. So isotropy loading and unloading. And you can see the velocity just uh, increases with the confining stress. And then when you decrease it, it just follows the same path. Right? And damping is the same. So it decreases with the confining stress because you have a more contact and the soil gets stiffer. So the so damping decreases, and when you uh, unload, when you decrease the uh, confining stress, then it just increases back, following the same path. And when you look at the actual compression loading, so up to this point, you had the isotropy loading, IL, and then from here, you have an uh, actual compression loading. And then you have axial compression unloading. Okay? So we are looking at this part. And here, still it follows the same velocity train. Right? So loading and unloading curve, they collapse each other, so they match well. And damping in the damping is the same. And So this is the case you have uh, extensional loading. So first you apply the isotropic loading, sigma no prime, and then you decrease the uh, only the uh, deviatoric stress, the axial stress by pulling it out. So you are decreasing the axial stress. So then we can say that it's an extensional loading, right? axial extension loading. Here, you started from here, oh, I think here, we started from here. When you apply the isotropic loading, you have increasing stress and the vertical strain increases, right? So that the soil gets compressed. And when you apply the extension loading, so now you are uh, taking the uh, top cap upward, so you have extension, volume extension. Right? And then this is the uh, unloading of the extension, extensional load. So now that you're uh, pushing the, the top cap again, and then release the all confining stress to here. Right? So from the isotropic loading, I think uh, it will come around here. And then uh, I think the square is the loading, so extensional loading is this. I, E, L, and this is I, E, unloading. Mm. Oh, sorry, I think this is wrong. Can we go back? What can I go back to the city? With soil, with soil. Uh, uh, mm, so, so that's why they apply the isotropy loading first. So they apply the isotropy loading up to this point, and then they release the vertical stress only. So this is a extensional loading curve. Still, it's larger than. 0 kilopascal, so 40, you have still like 60 kilopascal, right? So confining stress will be like 200 kilopascal to lateral, but the vertical stress is only, what, 80 kilopascal, 70 kilopascal, about that, right? And then 
this is the case with the unloading class. So you have some hysteresis right? during the loading and unloading case. And also in the damping, so you have decrease in damping with the decrease in vertical stress. And when you load it, you have some hysteresis. And using this data, we can uh, plug the experimental data to these two equations. Then we have these parameters like this. So, uh, 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 where is my pen? And theta related to sigma p. Sigma p is the uh, stress at the propagation direction. And sigma m is the stress at the particle movement direction. And during the extension, actual extension, you have 0 0.12, 0 0.16 for theta and delta. And compression, 0 0.1 and 0 0.17. And when you sum up, when you uh, sum the theta, when you add the theta and the delta together, you have the coefficient pretty similar to each other, right? And here, interesting thing is uh, when you obtain this mu and psi value, for the mean effective stress and the deviatory stress, then mu is about 0.28, and psi is almost zero. And for the axial compression, also it's about 0.28, and psi is almost zero. And when you sum up, it's 0.28, So interesting thing is that you have the same power exponent for two, ex two expressions. So for the isotropy loading, do you remember the, the original, uh, the, our expe expression? Ding. One kilopascal with the alpha and beta, right? And beta is equal to the sum of theta and the delta. So for the uh, direction, the stress at the propagation direction and stress at the uh, part particle movement direction. <coughs> and when you compare these two values, here and the theta and delta, which one is large? Delta is larger than the theta, right? So 0.17 and 0.1 here. Right? So this is 70% larger than the other parameter. So which means that uh, for the same amount of stress increment, for example, you have increased like right, 10 kilopascal to particle movement direction, and you have increased the uh, stress <coughs> at the um, wave propagation direction by 10 kilopascal, the former will increase the velocity more because you have a higher exponent. Does it make sense? So that means that for shear wave velocity, particle the stress acting on the direction of the particle movement have higher sensitivity to the wave velocity. So that is, that's here. So strong effect on the wave in the particle motion than the wave propagation because you have higher exponent value. And the second one is the psi is almost zero and the mu is same with the beta. So velocity is determined by the mean effective stress, not the deviatory stress. And mean effective stress in the polarization plane. So you have like shear wave polarized to one direction, then, but always you have a three dimensional space. So the wave will propagate in a three dimensional space so that you will have three different orthogonal plane, right? sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. But when, you, when your shear wave goes to this direction and it moves like this, then mm, what is it? this stress and 
the stress acting on the polarized direction will, act, will affect the wave velocity only. The other one is very, which one is the other one? Oh, this one doesn't affect the wave velocity then, right? If the particle moves like this, right? So that's the mean effective stress in the polarized plane means. Huh? conceptually you can understand it uh, conceptually um, so so far we've been we've seen the effect of a stress on isotropy on the round particle but when you have plate particle or irregular shape particle angular particle then because of the shape of the particle, you can have the fabric anisotropy. And that fabric anisotropy can be worse or can be uh, more exaggerated by the stress anisotropy. For example, uh, you have clay sedimented. And as you apply the stress, this clay particle will align parallelly as you apply the stress. So then you are accelerating the uh, fabric anisotropy to this plane. Right? So this is called the uh, stress-induced fabric anisotropy. So that's from the particle shape or the particle co the, uh, preferential particle alignment of the plate and essentially particle like clay. Um, I'm going to show you an um, example here. Uh, I think uh, this is the one that we talked before. So you have sigma, so before we had the uh, expression with the isotropy loading like this, right, beta. When you have isotropy loading, you have alpha and sigma prime, not prime, to the beta coefficient. And when you have anisotropy, you had something and sigma p prime plus sigma m prime two. Was it u? U and the deviatory stress, right? For psi, but psi is almost zero. So this becomes just identical. So then you can come up with this expression. Right? So here it assumes that beta will be the same with this mu exponent. And sigma p prime is the uh, stress at the wave propagation direction. Sigma m prime is the stress at the particle motion direction. Um, so here, interesting thing is that we had a uh, Otawa F1 10, which is very round particle, so spherical particle. And we apply the <coughs> vertical stress in the rigid wall cell. So here we have oidometric, maybe like consolidation case, so K9 loading condition. So here you have sigma vertical effective stress. And because it's a K9 condition, you have sigma 3 or the horizontal stress k naught times sigma 1. And which one is larger? In general, you have round particle, k naught will be less than 1, so the horizontal stress will be smaller than the round part, uh, the vertical stress, right? So sigma 1 is larger than the sigma 3. And uh, they put uh, band element 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 band element. So each one have different, direct, different angle, incident angle. So you have, in this case, you have horizontally parallel uh, aligned one. So this will vibrate like this. And the other end, you have uh, vertically aligned. So this will vibrate like this. Right? And you have different angle as you go to this direction. So here we have show a polarized horizontal HV. HV means what would be the HV means? 
Um, H, so I think this is the uh, direction of wave, wave direction. So wave goes propagate horizontally, go, go this direction. And V means that the particle movement direction, so particle moves vertically. And here you have H, H, so wave also goes to horizontal direction, and particle moves horizontally. Okay. I think that this will be uh, just round, uh, round shape, disk shape, the uh, container. And then you get this result. What does it mean? V, H, V. So vertically aligned bender element gives you the velocity around 90 meter per second, 88 meter per, meter per second, right? And horizontally aligned, the, this is, okay, horizontally moving, uh, horizontally polarized shear wave, velocity is less than that. So this should be the 88, and it's less than that, right? So this tells you that VHV is larger than the VHH. Why? HV. So this one vertically polarized shear wave particle moves vertically and when you think about the, the stress, the vertical stress was larger than the horizontal stress, right? Sigma 1 is acting on the, acting on the particle, the parallel to the particle movement. And in this case, horizontal movement of the particle is moving this direction, and you have the sigma 3 <coughs> acting on this, and sigma 3 was less than the sigma 1. So the difference between these two velocities just because of the, uh, uh, which one would that be? Um, this one, sigma m prime. <coughs> For this one, sigma m prime will be vertical stress. For this one, sigma m prime will be horizontal stress. Okay. So that's why you have a different velocity according to the polarized polarization plane. So, this makes the difference. Oh. Question? Then we have angular particle, uh, like long elongated particle. And here we have a, a show of last data with increasing vertical effective stress applied to the clay soil. And hmm, VHV is, which one is VHV? Uh, 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 I think. Wave goes to this direction and polarized in this direction. So this is VHV. And this one polarized the horizontal direction and V, VH. Okay. So both are shear wave, but the, it has different polarized direction and the wave propagation direction. So I think uh, in the setup, you have container like this and clay and you have a vendor element, this direction, and you have vendor element, this direction. And uh, when we look at the data for the same amount of the effective stress, for example, 100 kilopascal here, it's about 100 meter per second, and this is about 100 meter per second. 
And when you unload it, you have much higher velocity here, right? So, and the for as we increase the velocity and the effective stress, so this is about 700, 600, 700, 600. I think they repeated the same uh, loading step. It's about 1500 meter per second, but this is much higher. It's about 200 meter per second, right? So overall, the wave velocity VHV is much larger than VPH for the unloading curve and for the loading curve. So also it confirms that the wave velocity is more affected by the stress acting on the particle movement direction. So Vs is higher when the main axis of the particle parallel to the propagation direction. Mm -hmm. And wave goes to this direction. Oh, it's a plated particle. Sorry, so it, this is not about the, uh, the stress, it's about the alignment of the main axis of the particle. Because uh, you have a sigma 1, on the vertical stress and the horizontal stress. Right? And when you think about the mean effective stress, also will be the same, right? also will be the same for the VVH and the VHV. But uh, why we have the higher velocity for the VHV is because the particle is aligned parallelly to the propagation direction. Human? 말이 되는 거 같니? 오케이. 오케이. 어, the next effect is the strain effect. Strain effect is I think we very we are very familiar with this strain effect. The shear modulus curve degrades degrades with the with an increase in shear strain. So you have elastic stress or strain like this <coughs> around here and as the strain larger than the threshold strain, then it degrades. And damping also increases with the strain. And the, where is it? So this damping, you can see that the, as the confined stress increases, damping decreases, and also the, as you increase the Shear strain, damping increases like this. And you can use this equation to predict the damping. And also, you, use, you estimate first the uh, d minimum using the small strain measurement. And then, sum with the hyperbolic model to get the uh, strain dependent damping curve. And you can use hyperbolic mo model or you can use Lambert Osman model too. So this equation, this formula can be used to uh, fit the experimental data. And there are several models that you can use to see the effect of strain, hyperbolic model, and Lamberger's good model. And for the shear stress and second modulus shear stress, uh, shear stiffness, and the damping ratio, both. And just 
So this is also in the textbook. Uh, and then, um, we'll talk about the electrical force now. Um, so far, we have talked about the mechanical interaction between particles. And now, if you have a clay particle, then there's an electrical interaction between particles. So, and this electrical force begin more relevance as you have smaller particle. So this goes to small particle here. It's diameter of the particle in meter. So this is about what? One millimeter. This is one micrometer. And equivalent depth of the overburden is here the one meter. So electrical force governs have a prevailing effect on this clay at very near surface. And as you go deeper, maybe like if you go like 10 meter and 20 meter deep, then effective stress by the gravitational load is much, much, much larger than the electrical force. So the, there's no, uh, the if, if electrical force affects very small, or the, it could be very minimal. <coughs> so this electrical force will gain, and uh, you have to consider it for the very uh, surface soil, near surface soil. Mm, I think this is the uh, same thing. And the one experiment shows you is that this is a kaolinite and sedimentation and the consolidation test. So they change the porosity while they compressing compressing the kaolinite specimen. They measure the wave velocity and you can see that during the sedimentation, for example, like you have graduated cylinder like this, and you measure the wave velocity here, and you pour the uh, well, sus clay suspension, and then it will settle down. <coughs> right? And during the sedimentation, they measure the wave velocity. And here, shear velocity started from, it's very small, right? Like one meter per second. For the porosity of the ninety percent, and to fifty percent, you have like hundred meter per second. So the span is about like three hundred, three orders of magnitude, right? From here to here. So in this case, effective stress cannot capture this behavior. Effective stress. During the sedimentation, effective, you don't apply any stress. Okay? So effective stress is virtually zero. And here, during consolidation, you may have applied the effective stress, but mostly governed by the porosity okay? in the clay case. And this is another exper uh, interesting experiment. Here, they apply the loading to 100 kilopascal. So they, this is during the consolidation. And the wave velocity is around 50 meter per second. This is, they use the, I think, bentonite, bentonite. And what they did is uh, they pour the KCL salt at the top of the specimen. So maybe like this. This is the Momoyuna specimen and loading plate. And there's a hole at the loading plate and they put the KCL powder at the top of the, uh, this uh, oil metric cell. So then it will dissolve into water and then it will diffuse into the soil, right? So during the KCL, the potassium chloride diffusion, they measure the wave velocity and you see that it increases to around 190, maybe 100 meter per second, 90 meter per second. And why you have this increase in shear velocity during this potassium chloride 
diffusion, KCL diffusion, sold. So velocity almost doubled during this diffusion process. Then when you have salt dissolved, then it increased the ionic strength of the pore, pore water. Right? Then what happens to the double layer of the clay? Clay double layer, does it increase or decrease? Decrease, right? So you have more salt to compensate the negative charge. So you don't need water, so they will expel the water. So then, by this diffusion, you have contraction or the wall compression. So actually, they found that the, this loading plate settles, oh, sorry, sorry. it goes down during the diffusion. And then also, the, when they measure the wave velocity, it increases like this. So the clay particle was apart by some distance when you have a DI water and now you have a salty water they become closer and closer so that you can uh, transfer or the wave can propagate much faster than before so and also it correlates to the porosity so then we have seen the this data right and the shear velocity was a function of porosity and here by the diffusion porosity decreases so that you have increase in shear velocity so ionic concentration increases, double layer thickness decreases, so you get more compression and volume, uh, volume contraction. And this can be, uh, we can think opposite way too. So you have a clay deposit which was deposited during a glacial time so that you have more salty water and then it's exposed during the deglacial time I think the other way <laughs> deglacial time you had deposition and glacial time you, that was uh, exposed so that th then you have a fresh water coming in by the rain or something then ionic concentration will decrease so the soil shear stiffness will decrease and also the soil will expand now because the pore chemistry in terms of the pore chemistry ion concentration decreases because of the fresh water coming in right so that's why you get more uh, in the mm, clay deposit you can have the collapse soil collapse because of the rain or the fresh water coming in and that's exactly the opposite mechanism of this salt diffusion. Mm. Okay, then now we will talk about the cementation. Mm. Cementation, uh, we use soil improvement very often in the field and for for the soil improvement, you can do the just mechanical compaction, right? Compaction is the easiest way. And when you do the chemical treatment, you can inject some lime or cement grout or the epoxy water, the epoxy resin, or something like that. And then all of that, they, as they cure, they increase the soil strength and the stiffness. And, the, and that chemical agent we call a cementing agent. Right? And when you add the cementing agent, before, before the uh, uh, treatment, the loading and the particle-to-particle -particle grain contact will be like this. And as you apply the, uh, the cement or some epoxy, the cementing agent, you are increasing the grain contact area. Right? Then from there, you can increase the stiffness of the soil. Then for the uncemented soil, you have this kind of a loading curve. A shear sure velocity versus the loading, the effective stress. And oh, here, when you apply the cementation at the low stress region, you have higher shear sure velocity because the soil became more, more stiffer. Right? 
and if you increase more, uh, increase the effective stress more, at some point, this cementation will crush. Right? For example, you are applying the compression, at some point, this cementation will crush, so that the, again, it will be controlled by the stress. So here, we call it cementation control regime, and this is the regime that controlled by stress. So you can see the difference between the uncemented and the cemented soil. Right? And Stiffness increases with the increasing cement con concentration. So here, the CC means that cement concentration. As you increase the cementation, cementing agent concentration, you can see that the uh, uh, cementation control region becomes wider, and uh, also the stiffness increases like this. Okay. Um, and beta within the cementation control control region is beta is almost zero. So that the soil is already stiff, so that when you apply the stress, the shear wave velocity doesn't change much. And attenuation increases with the cement concentration at the low cement content. This is... Hmm. No, okay. So let's look at the real data. We have... We had the sand and cement mixture uh, here, uh, which was under the 70 kilopascal vertical loading. And as they cure, you can see that they, we have increase in wave velocity to around 500 meter per second. Right? So before it was about 200 meter per second. And when you apply the more stress before curing the cement, they started from around 300 meter per second, and then they also approached to around like 500 to 600 meter per second. You can see that the, the final wave velocity was more controlled by the cementation, cementing agent concentration. Okay. So they approached to a similar value. And here, this tells you that you apply the stress first, and then the cement gets cured, you will have increase in wave velocity during this procedure two. So procedure one is the confinement, procedure two is the cementation. Okay. And they also measure the damping. And you can see the damping increases a little bit with the cementation. So Vs Sorry, the Vs at 70 kilopascal, Vs at 400 kilopascal is similar to each other. And the reason that we have increase in damping is very difficult to explain because when you have stiffness increase, the resonant frequency increases. Right? So soil gets more stiffer, so you have a, a natural resonant frequency increases together. But if we think about the... Um, Viscoelastic material, do you remember the, where is it, this spring and dash part model, right? Or that you can have the Kelvin void model and you can have a standard linear solid model like this, right? And both tells you the increase in damping Before resonant, the resonant frequency with the omega, right? Omega or omega square, right? So damping increased with the omega square before. And here, but the, we didn't change the C, the damping coefficient. So here, uh, one may think that the reason that we have increase in damping ratio is just because of the increase in natural frequency. So that the real damping coefficient of the material may not have been increased by much. Okay. So we don't, we don't know the reason yet why we have this damping ratio increase. Is it because of the frequency increase or is it purely by the material loss increase? Okay. So I think this is that we have done. Huh? It's called elastic model that the damping 
ratio is proportional to the omega or the omega square. <coughs> and this is another indication that damping ratio also increases with the frequen resonant frequency linearly. <coughs> okay. Uh, Decimentation. The mm. <coughs> so one interesting thing is that uh, when you apply the cementation under high stress, it's different from that you apply the cementation at low stress. So this is the case you apply the cementation at this location. I think uh, in the uncemented case, it's going to be like this. And then at the, uh, this high stress condition around like 400 kilopascal, cement, the cement agent has been cured so that you have increase in shear velocity about this. So that the soil was compressed initially when the cement gets cured. And then when you decrease the uh, stress, it go, follows this curve. And then when you reroad that, you don't, this one doesn't follow the original curve. It will show you the slower wave velocity. Why? Because the, during the extension, when you unload it, the soil grain will feel the tension and the cement gets broken during this pen tension. Okay? So it's called a decementation by the stress release. So during this stress relaxation, cementation, cemented contacts are put into tension by the stretching of the grain at the contact and the cement breaks in tension. So you have a lower velocity at the second loading curve. Right? Um, let's compare these two cases. Here, you apply the cementation at 70 kilopascal for the same soil. And at the case B, you apply the cementation at 400 kilopascal. Okay. Here, so they apply the, the cementation here, and then you apply the stress. And when you unload it, it just follows the same path. right? So there is no cement decementation. There is no break in cement. But in this case, when you know that, you have breaking breaking so that you the in, during the loading curve, it doesn't follow the it doesn't recover the original cement strength or the cement shear stiffness. And we can think we can use this concept to think about the sampling effect. So when you take out the sample from the ground, that soil was under a very large stress. Right? And when you take it out using, using maybe Shelby tube, then you're releasing all the overboard stress and the lateral stress. So then they may expand so that you lose some aging effect in the the specimen. Okay. Mm. okay, I think we can skip that. So this video clip shows the what the Shelby tube is and the how people sample obtain the uh, the field sample using the Shelby tube. You can watch it later. Mm. And another decimentation example of the another uh, cement, decimentation effect is that when you have a diagenetically stiffened clay, and that's very stiff, and when you add the more water to it, they just uh, lose their strength. So diagenetically stiffened clay and unsaturated soils at low moisture content exhibit the cementation-like behavior. But when you add the water, at there is a loss in the skeletal stiffness 
during the water infiltration. So for example here, when the water added, you can see that the, you have mm, vertical strain decrease and the PL velocity decrease and the s wave velocity decreases. So your collapse happens. Another example of the decimentation. Mm. This shows the uh, similar result about the cementation. I just, I think uh, it just show you the, uh, the representative signal and shear wave velocity, the shear wave signature. This is the shear wave, shear wave signature by the Bendelman. And during, so from here, during loading, you can see that the arrival time increases and during unloading, decreases during reloading also it increases so during loading and unloading you have wave velocity increase and decreases during this uh, vertical effective stress loading cycle and for the cemented soil here during the loading and then when it cures wave velocity also increases by this much you can see the arrival time got faster and you can see that the what is this uh, frequency of the arrived signal is increased very much. So now you have very high frequency content comparing to before curing. Okay. Before curing, the wave is like this long wave, and here you have very short wave. And during loading and unloading, here cementation, so that you have jump in the wave velocity. And during loading, you have break at the cement or the failure. So that it follows the, this curve and then unloading curve is like this. And this shows that the uh, decimentation by additional loading. So decimentation occurred due to additional loading. Mm. Almost done. Uh, what is creep? So the last one is about the creep effect and the time-dependent behavior of the soil. <laughs> creep is the constant load and long-term deformation of the material. <laughs> so even though it's like a secondary consolidation, you apply the same amount of effective stress and soil gets compressed continuously. Okay. And the strain rate is so, let's see, strain rate can be expressed by this stress term with the exponent m1 and also the uh, time dependent term with the m2. And here the k and the m1 and m2 are experimentally empirically determined material parameter. So uh, to see the effect of creep, they use the lead shot as a specimen. So they, it's a nap, nap dongori, lead shot. So they had a nap, nap kusuru yung. So they used the lead shot and they made this uh, granular packing of the lead shot. And then they increased the confinement and they measured the uh, Shear velocity and the damping ratio during uh, using the RCTS. You can see here the after one hour, and this is after hundred hours. So you see that increase in wave velocity and also decrease in damping during this creep behavior. And when you plot the velocity against the vertical strain before it was the, against the confinement, right? When you apply, uh, when you plot the wave, wave velocity and the damping ratio against the vertical strain, actually it follows the just unique one line, right? So this wave velocity can be correlated to the vertical strain. And vertical strain actually, you can change it to porosity, 
or the void ratio. And before, we've seen that the shear velocity was following the unique line against the velocity, right? During the sedimentation and the remote, remote and the consolidation. So it's the same. The, for the creep behavior too, the shear velocity and the damping ratio can be uh, correlated to the vertical strain or the velocity. So all loading stage collapse onto a single continuous train. Yeah. Mm. The last effect is the temperature effect. And also temperature, in, as you increase the temperature, also you increase the vertical strain and accelerate the creep behavior. For example, here they use the salt, the, the table salt, so sodium chloride. And when they heat it to 50 degrees Celsius, you have increase in velocity. And during cooling, it stays at the same. Oh, oh, and the, so before, you, so this kind of a temperature dependent creep behavior and the secondary consolidation is very long-term process. And I want to show you the, uh, the short-term time-dependent effect. And this experiment investigated the effect of the liquefaction. And after the liquefaction, how they recover the shear wave velocity or shear stiffness. So what they did is uh, they have a, uh, how big is it? Um, three, six, six. about 20 centimeter specimen or 20 centimeter specimen and uh, they put the uh, two, three, four, five pair of a band element and hand also they measure the pore, pore water pressure and here outside of the wall they put install the accelerometer to measure the acceleration mm, and they apply the impact at the bottom so it's like an earthquake so if you apply the enough impact to make it liquefy, liquefy, then the soil will lose their strength from the bottom. Right? So, and after that, when they get liquefied, does it have any stiffness? No, it would just behave like a viscous liquid, so it doesn't have any shear stiffness. So then, if you have, if you don't have shear stiffness, then wave velocity will be zero. Shear wave velocity of the water is zero. So then. During the liquefaction, you don't get any signal because it's just going to be just water. And then they will start to recover their strength, the stiffness, sorry, stiffness. And it's called the post-liquefaction stiffness. So uh, during this experiment, they wanted to see that how, they, how the soil recovers their uh, shear stiffness after the liquefaction. So, this is the setup. You have a LVDT at the top, pore pressure gauge, mm, pore pressure gauge acceleration, and these are the band element they put. <coughs> so five band element. And when you apply the acceleration, so this is the acceleration shows you that the, uh, the time when you apply the impact. And before the impact, the shear velocity at the bottom was Sorry, shear wave signature is like this. So you have a clean, very clean S wave signal arriving at the receiver band element. This is the before impact. And when you apply the impact so that the soil gets liquefied here, you don't get any signal. Right? Here, after the 0.1 second, now you see a little bit of the amplitude increased. 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and around after one second, you get the oh, 1.5 second. 1.5 second, you get the clear S wave signal recovered. So it took about 1.5 second to recover the original shear stiffness. And here, so this is the signal before impact, and this is the signal after the impact. 
it's uh, difficult to see the wave velocity, right? But generally, I think the wave velocity didn't change that much here. Maybe you have a little bit of a decrease and increase in arrival time. Uh, sorry, the increase in arrival time and then decrease in arrival time. But uh, it's hard to tell. So you can only see the, uh, uh, the amplitude change clearly. And the uh, wave velocity from top to bottom, at the bottom, so this was the original velocity. Original wave velocity is here. And during this moment, you don't get any signal. So shear stiffness was mutually zero, virtually zero. And they start to recover it around like 0.2 seconds after that. And the upper layer, so this is the, uh, the bottom second layer. Then this around like 0.4 second layer, 0.4 second later, they start to recover the shear stiffness. So you can see that as you go, the liquefaction happened at the same time for the whole specimen, but the stiffness recovery started from the bottom. And then they start to uh, propagate to the top. 